ຈຶ່ງຍັງກຸຈໍອອງຈຸນຍຸມແລະປະກາດບັນຕໍຕາຍຈໍາລາການນິຕິວິທີສຳນັກການສະດັບສະໄຄກໍາສະໄສແລະ
le secteur 33, quand il était euh, donc, euh, attaché à la sécurité du secteur responsable de la sécurité du secteur 33, euh, qu'il avait rencontré euh, l'ethnographe M. Bison. Et celui-ci, vous avez repris l'incitation de M. Bison euh, dans, euh, dans euh, votre livre, euh, page 39, en français. Bison sorti de cette épreuve effaré par le fanatisme de Dutch. Selon lui, Dutch croyait que les Cambodgiens, qui avaient des points de vue différents du sien, étaient des traîtres et des menteurs. Il battait lui-même les prisonniers qui ne disaient pas la vérité. Vous avez, indiqué, donc, vous avez repris euh, cette indication de M. Bison. Plus loin, vous avez indiqué que a acquis des compétences dans le domaine de la sécurité au fil du temps. C'est vraisemblablement entre 1972 et 1973 qu'il n'est pas élaborat sa conception très sophistiquée des trahisons impliquant des chaînes de traîtres. Une opération secrète fut en effet alors mise en œuvre par les mecs rouges afin de purger ce qu'on appelait les Khmer Anoï. Plus loin, vous ajoutez, l'aspect furtif et impitoyable de cette campagne d'opération répondait peut-être au style administratif naissant spécifique à Dutch. Elle laissait présager du mode opératoire de S21. Donc, bien entendu, pour moi, il apparaît que Douche n'a pas été euh, donc, choisi, bien entendu, euh, au hasard. Et euh, il y a bien eu euh, dans ce cadre-là une évolution de celui-ci, d'abord en premier lieu vis-à-vis -vis de euh, sa biographie. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez euh, nous euh, dire euh, euh, par rapport donc, à cet élément-là que vous nous donnez et par rapport à ce que vous nous avez dit euh, ce matin, euh, si euh, Dutch, en fin de compte, ne faisait qu'appliquer ce qu'on lui demandait, qu'appliquer des ordres, ou s'il avait, en fin de compte, amélioré le système, s'il avait réussi lui-même à faire en sorte que S21 c'est ce qu'il l'a été, et s'il a, a ensuite amélioré le système. Uh, thank you. There's a lot of <coughs> questions inside uh, that question. Uh, um, the last one, um, <coughs> I think, I, I don't think I ever said he was merely the servant of the people above him. I think he's, his, one of his main objectives at S21 was to satisfy their requirements. Had he failed to do that, uh, his would have been in danger. That was an obvious thing. But you're quite right, and I think I've tried to make this point this morning, uh, that he was an enthusiastic and proud administrator of S21 who worked out uh, techniques and organizational uh, methodology uh, from scratch. I said also that there was there were no precedents for this kind of place. Uh, the very limited experience he'd had in the Civil War was not quite enough for a, an institution of this size, so he was obviously innovating, uh, as you say, improving uh, all the time. And I think he was doing uh, not only what his superiors obviously thought was a reasonably good job, or, he, or we would have known that he would have been uh, dismissed, but also what he himself thought was a, not just a satisfactory job, but an excellent job. I think he wanted to excel in this job and indeed in other things earlier in his career. He wanted to excel as a student. He wanted to excel as a uh, apprentice revolutionary. And throughout his uh, professional life, I think he was interested in not just uh, serving those above him. That wasn't that hard, really, but to serve them uh, with enthusiasm and skill that he can be proud of himself.
Je vous remercie, M. Euh, Chandler. Euh, euh, justement, euh, pour rebondir sur ce euh, que vous Chandler. venez de dire, euh, euh, il, y a, euh, en fait, euh, il y a eu pendant ces débats euh, quelques euh, difficultés en ce qui concerne justement peut-être le rôle euh, de la douche euh, au moment des interrogatoires ou sur la pratique euh, de euh, la torture. En effet, euh, il a à quelques reprises indiqué qu'il n'était pas aux interrogatoires et euh, il ne savait euh, pas euh, exactement comment euh, se pratiquait la torture. Est-ce que euh, véritablement, au vu des documents euh, que vous avez, dont vous avez pris connaissance, au vu de l'analyse de la personnalité de douche que vous avez faite, au vu, au vu véritablement de son, de son cursus, vous pensez qu'il pouvait ignorer quoi que ce soit de ce qui pouvait se passer à S21 et qu'il ne, qu ne pouvait pas ne pas être l'initiateur de tout ce qui se passait à S21 I'll uh, split your question into its last two components, I think. Uh, he was <coughs> made it his business, certainly, to be aware of what was happening. I don't think he wanted the prison to get out of hand. He knew, I think, that on occasion some of the interrogators uh, got out of hand and behaved badly, and these were people were chastised and in some cases even brought into S21 as prisoners. Uh, I think he was a person who trusted the people directly underneath him to keep him informed of the daily activities of the prison. I think in, when imported prisoners came into the prison, he paid more personal attention than he did to minor people, uh, but the second part of your question, uh, or your remarks, I, I, I can't uh, buy into the idea that he was the sole initiator of what was going on in S21. One of the characteristics of Chinese style revolution and the Cambodian revolution was the amount of leeway given to individual people to behave in a revolutionary manner, whatever that meant. Uh, so that he was hoping that his subordinates, as sincere and uh, active revolutionaries, would behave in a properly revolutionary manner, again, whatever that means. So he, he, I don't think he was the sole initiator or the sole sort of uh, monitor of what was happening. I think he, through his immediate subordinates, I think he was pretty well aware of what was going on. I don't think a whole lot escaped his attention. But I think, uh, in other words, I, I am, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that my impression from what I've read and, and uh, studied is that he was a very able, efficient administrator of the place he was in charge of. He did a good job at what he was supposed to be doing, and he was part of that. Je vous remercie, M. Chandler. Je vous avons évoqué, et vous l'avez évoqué, sur demande de M. le juge Lavergne, qui a fait justement remarquer que vous parliez souvent de déshumanisation au sein de S21 dans votre livre. Alors, vous avez évoqué la déshumanisation, bien sûr, des prisonniers, 
mais je voudrais revenir sur la déshumanisation euh, des gens qui travaillaient à S21, des gardiens, mais peut-être principalement euh, des interrogateurs, car euh, à des faits, l'on peut se poser la question de savoir comment on peut sans émotion, sans regret, commettre les actes qui ont été commis à S21. Et je voudrais que vous nous donniez plus d'explications sur ce phénomène, sachant que, en effet, dans votre livre, vous avez apporté une conclusion extrêmement intéressante sur ce point-là. Je, je me permets de la reprendre. Elle est page 186, code RN00357432. Les explications des phénomènes comme S21 résident dans notre capacité à ordonner et à obéir, à nous souder contre les étrangers, à nous perdre au sein du groupe, à aspirer à la perfection et à l'approbation et à décharger notre haine et notre, notre confusion sur d'autres individus, souvent sans défense, particulièrement lorsque nous y sommes encouragés par des gens que nous respectons. Est-ce que vous pouvez développer un peu ce, comment vous voyez euh, ce problème vis-à-vis -vis des gens qui travaillent à S21 Well, you've quoted uh, from the last paragraph of my book where I'm trying to sum up as best I can what seemed to me to be happening uh, not only at S21, but at several other facilities and several other moments of history where this kind of behavior went, uh, went on. And these could include uh, the massacres in Indonesia in 65, the concentration camps in the Holocaust, the uh, jails in uh, South America in the 1970s, uh, behavior of the Greek colonels. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global phenomenon. The S21 is not by no means unique. Uh, the kinds of behavior that can be unleashed uh, by people uh, operating with permission uh, against people whom they uh, have already dehumanized themselves. Uh, you notice all the euphemisms that are used in warfare. We very seldom say that the people are killing people. You say that having body count, collateral damage, uh, phrase of the sort, or smashing enemies, for example. The word kill is not used. Uh, I didn't reach that last paragraph through any empirical investigation. That last paragraph sprang to me, and I wrote it quite quickly, I must admit, as a way of trying to come to grips with the whole uh, phenomenon of S21 and more, and more close to home, to come to grips with the uh, four years that I'd spent working on the book. I didn't want to say <coughs> that what was happening at S21 was done by another kind of people operating far away. But I wanted to suggest that under certain conditions, happily that have been non-existent in my own life, under certain conditions, almost anyone could be led to perform uh, activities of this kind. Now, the staff of S21, um, rather like uh, some of the uh, people studied uh, in the Holocaust, especially by the author Christopher Browning, um, once their behavior was routinized and once these people were not punished and once they were permitted to go further and further steps. You find the same thing in the Cultural Revolution among the Red Guards. Uh, they didn't pull up short. They operated generally with more enthusiasm rather than less. Why this is true, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a dark side, I think, to all of us. And that was the point I was trying to make in that last paragraph. Uh, that does not come, as I say, from empirical research on the staff of S21, 
but from uh, years of immersion in this subject. Je vous remercie, M. Chandler. Je n'aurai pas d'autres questions. Je vais laisser la parole à Boko Chandler, qui est le groupe de droits. Merci, M. Chandler. Je vais laisser la parole à Boko Chandler, qui est le groupe de droits. Merci, M. Chandler. Je vais laisser la parole à Boko Chandler, qui est le groupe de droits. Je vais laisser la parole à Boko Chandler. Tang suốt tận lúc David Chandler. Chia tay tận nắng sùng nô bò lúc xây phạm gen môn ní lúc bàn lúc lang tay chuẩn 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 ta cả cầm tịch không mang, nâng ca chơi chơi không mang, đại lục ban riệp rộp, tam để giải ca sai chơi ai cả sa nâng sầm phe, cần lo một nơi nâng con ông, nâng con ông xịt phơi rồi bỏ lốp, ta lốp ai bận chạy ban tết thật sầm rập mê đắc nom không ai cả hòm, đại tự tu khóc trời phù một phốt, nâng chân chọp chát đại chỉ nhẹ đắc nom mình tì sau một phay môi nút, kết tha ca cầm tịch nâng ca bỏ sầm ăn đi cứ chỉ chụp chơi này cắt phơi bạc để vót để bọc cái, rước đôi đại biện sau đại kiện như vậy tham hà bạc để vót mà hà lột lo anh chàng mẹ đại tỷ. Okay, um, I'm not sure how to answer the last part of your question. I think uh, we said, I said earlier, I've been brought up by many people that. Secrecy was a key characteristic of the democratic Cambodian regime. Certainly, until things began to get seriously difficult or complicated, Smoke's mind was in Khmer. In 1978, another characteristic of the revolution was its headlong pace and its headlong enthusiasm and its uh, self, its assurance that its revolutionary behavior would carry everything before it, the problems would no longer arise. I think of this, this kind of absolute confidence that they were on the right track uh, was uh, very dangerous, that no one was given time to ask questions, no one was given time to hesitate, there was no uh, chance to certainly contradict and that we know very well, it certainly couldn't contradict the leadership, so that it became, the regime became rather like a, a waterfall in which everyone was caught up. សមាគមនៅក្នុងបន្ទីសមភ័យមួយគឺលោកបានរៀបរាប់អំពីការវិវត្តនៃការកំទេចខ្មាំងគឺចាប់ផ្ដើមពីការកំទេចមន្ត្
whether what happened under the Khmer Rouge can be characterized as genocide or not. The key ingredient of genocide, according to the UN Convention anyway, which is the place to look for definitions rather than somewhere else, is intent. You have to find evidence or proof that the regime or its leaders specifically intended to smash particular ethnic groups, not, not their own people. Whether you find that, I was talking in my previous answer, in one of my answers, I was mentioning how a certain amount of, of confidence was given to people and support was given to people who were behaving in what they felt was a truly revolutionary manner. And here, the parallels to draw, I think, are with the uh, Cultural Revolution in China, where what was called ultra-left deviation was not punished. In other words, the further left you could go, the more praise you got. So it seems to me that if the general idea of smashing enemies, not so much the revenge killings that took place in 75 against former members of the Khmer Republic Army, who, when they were uh, disarmed, could just be assassinated. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the smashing of internal enemies inside the party and how the language is always very vague coming from the top and also we also lack a lot of the language coming from the top as I said many of the documents are, are just not in our possession uh, but certainly you never I, no document that I'm aware of has the leadership declaring that too many enemies are being killed. In other words, the number is never excessive. So you're getting close to a kind of intent that's quite complicated, I think, in other countries. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chandler. My name is Sylvia Stutsinski. I'm a lawyer for the Chandler. I would like to put first the question to you of the general nature, and this is the following. Uh, could, do you have, according to your research, um, uh, could you tell us, rephrase, could you tell us uh, what is the duration and the length of stay of prisoners in tool slang? Um, what did your research, what time frame did your research Bring out. The, I'm not exactly sure what the upper limit would be. I know some of the senior people were tool slang for several months, in other words, more than two months. But the, the shortest span would be the people who were driven in in trucks, and then the trucks were immediately sent out of the prison. They weren't even enrolled in the prison. The trucks just went out to the uh, killing fields, partly because the prison was too crowded and partly because the prisoners coming in the trucks were not uh, of high, including any high-ranking responsible cadre. So in other words, the length of time would go from none to several months. I, I think somewhere in my book, I can't exactly pinpoint it, I tried to work out what seemed to me, the documents I read, the length of time uh, from their entry to their 
to the end of their interrogation, which of course means uh, pretty closely to their uh, execution. And I thought most of the people were there between two and three weeks. Thank you. The accused uh, told us about one prisoner, uh, Mr. Ton, um, who has been there for 20 months. Um, could you, what would you say, according to your knowledge and research results, could this be possible? And I add, without being interrogated in depth in tool slang. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I can't have given an answer. I didn't run across a specific prisoner or that specific information. Uh, and I'm not, I haven't been present at enough of the sessions of the tribunal to judge how this statement fits into other statements by the accused. Uh, it seems, and it seems to me quite strange that someone would be kept there that long. Uh, on the other hand, uh, again, this is just supposition. I don't see what cause is served uh, by inventing this information. So I'm happy to hear corroboration if there is some, but it seems, does seem quite strange to me. Thank you. Same uh, to. Us. Um, I would like to move on now to. Um, confessions of interrogators that you have um, read and analyzed, and there I would like to um, draw your attention to those confessions of uh, Mr. Buteng, Mr. Wong Sam, Sam Matt, and um, Mr. Chiam Mai and Mr. Sok Ra. These are interrogators that uh, appear in your Hi. book or are quoted uh, in your uh, book uh, and it uh, is found uh, with uh, the footnote, uh, endnotes on page 131. Uh, and uh, my question is, these interrogators who talked about um, sexual assault that they uh, have committed and uh, that they admit in their confessions, could you describe um, what they have confessed? Monsieur, merci, Monsieur le Président. Je fais objection à cette question. Il me semblait que la Chambre avait rappelé la Convention internationale contre la torture dont est parti le Cambodge et qui interdit d'utiliser la substance des aveux. Je souhaiterais qu'on rappelle cette règle à ma consoeur et que les témoins soient dispensés de répondre à cette question. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to respond to this. Of course, uh, I have the anti-torture convention in my mind. Anti-torture convention in my However, I would like to say that, of course, here since this start of this trial, of course, all parties, including the, the Chamber, have referred to confessions. But I rephrase and um, try the following to put to you, Mr. Chandler, that is, um, 
You mentioned these confessions uh, that I have listed, uh, these uh, interrogators. Um, and I would like to know if you found on these confessions which um, admit sexual crimes or sexual assaults, harassment, rapes, uh, if you found on these confessions annotations. As far as I recall, there were no annotations on these confessions. A point I'd like to raise on these particular ones, though, the uh, questions, uh, interrogations of interrogators at S21 are a peculiar uh, category. They're a peculiar category because it seems to me the people interrogating these interrogators would have been probably aware of some of the things that these people had actually done. So it's not a question of somebody coming in from 200 miles away and saying he belongs to the CIA. It's a question of a colleague saying something that I don't think would have required torture to elicit from this person. The person was facing his colleagues. He knew he was doomed. He also did not know that he would ever be released. He knew what was going to happen. It seems to me that these uh, confessions are the closest ones to being true in the collection. That's, what I, that's my own view. Uh, certainly, uh, you have evidence from, I think, uh, Cox Ross and others uh, said that there was some evidence of sexual assaults in the prison. Rare, but interestingly, these were being punished. This is the, this is the point, part of the point of this, these confessions. These are being not only punished with re-education sent to pray saw, these people were condemned to death for committing those, for admitting to those, those, those acts. So I don't think, uh, I mean, I agree certainly with what uh, the lawyer for the defense has mentioned, but my feeling is that these confessions uh, did not require torture to be elicited. Some of them, these, these ones would have been people would Known what was happening. They knew what had happened. They told their colleagues what had happened. And then that was it. Thank you. Um, my next um, question refers to um, a statement of the accused who told us uh, that his former school teacher was raped or as the accused understood at this time uh, was sexual abuse and um, he learned uh, at the time that this rape happened and he did not punish the uh, perpetrator and after consulting Son Sen, that is what uh, the accused uh, told us. According to your uh, knowledge as an expert, uh, how does this practice um, can match with the general view that sexual crimes were severely punished, which is a common perception of course. I had read that uh, statement by um, the defendant, and it seems to me at that stage of his uh, stewardship over S21, he was not only getting uh, more disillusion, but he also felt, I think, that were these people with whom he'd been close given anything like a special treatment, but this would have been noticed by the people on top. And I think that's why he went to Sun Sen about this particular case, because these were people that he, that Sun Sen knew these were his former patrons. These were people he, he was very sorry to see come into the prison, but they were people with whom he'd been close. Uh, beyond that, I, don't, I, I, I can't get into that except to look at the other confessions you cited, which seem to me to be case of people who are uh, confessing to having uh, done those things, and actually the person who uh, assaulted uh, the wife of his former school teacher was later brought in, later brought in S21 and made this confession. That's how we have the text of it. Um, my last uh, question uh, um, to you is, um, what is your conclusion um, about the 
risk of females um, were imprisoned in in slang and uh, related to being at risk to become victim of sexual violence in Tulsang. And if you could elaborate also on maybe a vulnerable group among females, the most vulnerable group among females. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I don't think I can elaborate on which group is the most vulnerable or, or make an assessment as to how often this happened. I think uh, it wasn't, uh, it didn't, my, just what I've learned about this place, uh, it was not open season, uh, to use a horrible phrase, on women prisoners. These were not instantly uh, considered to be uh, uh, available for members of staff to molest and abuse. Uh, there's just not evidence to prove that. Um, I think, on the other hand, uh, the situation in the prison was pretty volatile. And I'm not excusing any, anybody's behavior, but this is a locked up compound full of young men who, on some occasions, I think certainly behaved in an abominable fashion and inexcusable fashion. But I don't get the feeling that had this kind of these kind of offenses been absolutely generalized, that the prison would have uh, continued to operate as it should have. And I think it would have come to the attention of certainly Deut and other people that this was going on and it would have been stopped. But this is supposition. I don't have the evidence. What I cannot do is tell you who were the more vulnerable of the women. My suspicion would be probably that women with better connections or the wives of higher ranking cadre would be less vulnerable, but that's just a guess. Thank you for your answer. Only uh, last, um, uh, what I want to add is what I found in uh, your book that is on page 38 where you're talking uh, that uh, Vietnamese uh, female prisoners uh, um, uh, were highly at risk. Right, well then let me withdraw what I said. I hadn't remembered that I'd written that, but th those people would be certainly the most highly uh, at risk ones. These were people who were uh, considered just ipso facto as uh, outside the human race at the time the war had started with Vietnam. So they would be indeed, if you want the most vulnerable group, that would be it. I, uh, I should have remembered that sentence in mind. Thank you, Mr. Chandler. Um, I'm running out of time. And, uh, my colleagues, thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. My name is um, Alain Werner, and I'm a counsel for um, Civic Party Group 1 with my national colleague, Tishrina. And I have uh, 30 minutes and a half to ask you my questions. I was intending to put quite um, several um, statement for you. I would be grateful if you, as much as you can, if you could just answer briefly like this, maybe I will be able to put to you everything I was, uh, I was hoping to. Um, I would like to start just with uh, one thing. Um, George Cartwright this morning asked you about um, the last plan and asked you about who would, um, the reason why you thought due to the last plan. I just one question very brief on this. Um, page 22 of your book, he said, the last plan was his shadow. It's a French name. I'm not sure how to pronounce it in English, but is his shadow. I just want to ask you, wh why did you say that? Well, because it seems to me, oh, yeah, it seems to me to be the most extended uh, discourse uh, by Deut on a subject that was not related to a specific confession. It was his attempt to draw together what he saw and, uh, and interpreted as evidence. And his, it, it was kind of like drawing a mathematical set of mathematical formulas onto a 
blackboard or whiteboard, and to him, I would just guess, I can't speak for him, of course, uh, unless, of course, the whole thing was made up to, uh, to fool uh, people above him, I, I doubt that was the case, that this was a true and sensible uh, interpretation of the data that had come to his attention. Thank you. This morning you, you spoke about this, this um, at the end of the confessions, this list of names that the prisoners were requested to, um, to give. In your book, page 38, you spoke about um, something else. You spoke about um, summaries that were done by the staff itself, page uh, 105. And let me read you what you said. You said, name listed in the strings, strings sorry, were used as a basis for additional arrests. And then you said that. They were also consolidated type written summaries bring together the names of people affiliated with certain military units, sectors, offices, factories, or work sites. Do you stand by that? So I will have to stand by it, I guess. I would like to follow up on that, and considering now what you said this morning about this list of names, enemies, traitors, that the prisoners were supposed to give, and then this work product produced by the, um, the staff at S21. Before you, as you probably know, Dr. Hutchinson testified here, he testified in May, and myself I asked him, because he spoke as well about this list, these names, and this work product produced by the staff, and I asked him, um, according to him, who, um, who ordered, if anyone, uh, those uh, materials to be produced. And here is what he said, page 18, the position of Mr. Hutchinson, um, Friday, 23, 28 May. Here is what he said, Council, I cannot immediately recall ever having seen an order per se to produce such lists other than an order directed at a specific prisoners. prisoner. My understanding is that this was a practice developed and refined by the accused person himself and that the accused person's superiors found this practice so helpful that this one, one reason, he eventually was promoted to be the chief of S21. Would you agree with uh, Dr. Hutchinson on that? It sounds reasonable. Uh, I don't have any documentary proof to go along with that. Uh, it's a reasonable supposition, yes. Thank you. Um, you spoke in your book, page 38 of your book, about the condition of detention. And here's what you said, page 38. You said, isolation, poor food, silence, were crucial to breaking the prisoners down in preparation for their interrogations. For, as Foucault has suggested, quote, solitude is the primary condition of total submission. Now, Witnesses in this court spoke as well about lack of hygiene, prisoners being shackled in the cells, um, not possibility to go to the bathroom for using cans, people being beaten up in the cells. Would, would you agree to say that these other um, characteristics were also devised um, in preparation for interrogation to break down, as you said, and to prepare for final submission? Would you, would you agree with that? So, so your mic was not in. Yes, I do agree. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm rushing the answers. My fault. I'm grateful for you for an, uh, rushing answers because it allowed me to, to rush as well. Um, so, would you would you agree that this appalling just to 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 finish this point? Would you agree that these appalling conditions of detention? Um, when we are part and parcel 
of this system to break the, prison, the prisoners down and to get the confession, the information at all costs. Would you agree with that? Yes, except that, of course, it started the minute they arrived in the trucks. It was unrelenting. These people, when they arrived in the trucks, were already garbage. They were already uh, non-humans. Uh, the objective was to keep them in that condition, and uh, yes, to break them down. And, and uh, mercy was have had no uh, place in the prison. But yeah, it was all headed down the track toward the interrogation and execution. That was the, the way the whole place was uh, moving. Thank you, sir. You said page 85 of your book, and I'm just curious because there was no, there was no footnote, so I just wanted to, would like to know why or how could you say that. You said that it's possible that higher-ranking prisoners during um, confessions were given other confessions to read. My understanding is that you were saying that maybe they were given the confession of other prisoners to read while they were themselves uh, being interrogated. And there was no footnote. I know it's a very long time you wrote this book, but can you remember um, why you said that? <laughs> Look, um, the confession of I should have had a footnote. Well, I think it's still true. I don't know where I got the, the sentence. And then, and then on page, and don't worry, there was a footnote on this one, on page 88, um, you spoke about the fact that the confession then at the end, or the final product, there were six copies done, and you explained very in detail which copy were went. What, which could be how, how it was distributed. Um, do, you know, do you know who invented the system of, of multiple copies of confession then? Some for the upper echelon, some sent to, to the various units. Do you have any idea why or who decided that who ordered that system? I think it was probably... Uh, it strikes me as consistent with other innovations by the defendant at making a efficient and, uh, you know, uh, exemplary uh, institution. Thank you. Um, page 132 of your book, you said this. Dutch was merciless, telling an interrogator on one occasion, I quote, beat the prisoner until he tells everything, beat him to get at the deep things. And, and there was a footnote on this one. Um, do you stand by that, that Dutch was merciless? Yes, he was merciless. Yes, I do. I, I mean, being merciful would have got nobody anywhere in that prison. So uh, maybe this statement uh, I used to illustrate maybe a certain um, intense mercilessness that may have been uh, not quite as strong on other occasions, but it seems to me a person who comes out with sentences like that is, uh, is merciless. Now, sir, there is, a, as you know, him how he came here to testify, and on the 20th of July, um, I put to him um, an earlier statement he gave, and this is, in this statement he had said, um, in this office 21, I heard Mr. Dutch and Mr. Hall said that we should kill all and keep only four million. So I asked him about that in court, and here is what he said. As I already stated early on, during the study session lecture by Dutch, he personally and directly said that everyone would be, would be smashed or killed, not only the people who were detained at S21, I believe, because he said that we had to kill them all. So there were prison, prisons all across the country, so I mean everyone would be killed. And later on the same day, my colleague who is not here today, Mr. Hong Kim Soon, asked him again about that, and here's what he said. Dutch stated, stated, he said everyone has to be killed, leaving only four million people, and then later on he said everyone be shall be smashed to bits. And that statement I still remember ever since. Now, based on your year, years of research, does it seem to you possible or likely that Dutch would have said something like that during the training session? 
I have not seen that. Uh, I'm not sure that the document of that particular study session has survived, because I certainly looked at a lot of those. Uh, it's a vivid memory on the part of uh, him who he, uh, it seems to me that it's not unthinkable that it should have been said. Uh, I think, uh, on the other hand, the, the business of saying that up to half uh, the population of Cambodia at that time, four million, uh, that figure, that, that seems harsher than I would have thought. But I mean, I, 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 can't, I don't want to disrespect someone's memory, and I haven't read the document coming from the study session, but that figure of four million stuck in his head. Now, I don't know who, if, if at that point the defendant really believed that at least half the country was uh, of no use to the revolution, uh, in which case this would be the strongest statement along those lines that I've read in my time of studying the Khmer Rouge. Now, so, um, as you, you may or you may not know, um, the accused in the court I explain, explained several times that Sun Sen was monitoring and paying very close attention to his work, at least until 77, where he was sent to the battlefield. Now, you said this morning that um, Sun Sen and the other member of the standing committee had would have had no interest for prisoners at S21 who are not important. I just want um, to read you something that um, Dr. Hutchinson said and about the same topic, and I would like to know if you could agree on that. 27 May 2009, um, page 90, and he gave an example about the same topic about Sun Sen. He said, for example, in the Ministry of Social Action, many very ordinary illiterate peasants, girls, were given a few hours of training on how to make injections with a syringe when were then declared to be nurses and put to work in hospitals. A surprising number of such people ended up being tortured and executed at S21 in accusation, in accusation of being CIA agent or KGB agent. It is indeed difficult for me to believe that someone with the heavy national responsibilities that Sun Sen carried would spend any time at all paying much attention to the interrogation or execution of such individuals. Could you agree with that assertion of Dr. Hutchinson? Yes, it seems like a, a, a uh, exception to the rule, uh, but if uh, it happened, it happened. I mean, if he might, uh, I don't know why a purge swept through the hospitals. It could have been that uh, a particular uh, high-ranking cadre was connected with those hospitals, and uh, Son Sen wanted to make sure that all the confessions fell into line with the uh, uh, persecution of that particular cadre. I'm not, I can't quite remember. I can't remember at all, actually who that might have been, but, you know, it came from one of your earlier questions. I think you need to understand, it's probably because it's my French accent, and I'm reading very fast because I'm running out of time. Basically, what I read meant that something would have not known about that. I'm sorry, that's what I read. Sorry, could you repeat that, sir? Uh, again, it would probably be the same uh, issue, and I mean, maybe maybe the defendant remembers this particular case uh, well. I don't remember it from my work, but uh, there was some reason to concentrate on this particular group, possibly because of some links with a senior, a relatively senior figure. And all these confessions had to be uh, laid in line and brought in, in, uh, in coordination with each other. But that's, again, supposition. I'm not, I'm not familiar with these particular texts. At least now. I might have been 10 years ago. So can, I, so, Your Honor, can I ask one more question? Thank you. Um, so I would like to, to ask you one final question. And um, about you spoke at the end about the, uh, the idea of choice and whether or not the, the accused had any choice or margin of maneuver. I just would like to put to you something Mam Nai said in this court, and just to have your view, and then I will be uh, will finish with my question. He um, said that on the 15th July 2009, page 47, and 
Here is what he said. Other than those in the unit, those who joined the revolution with me, when, whenever Dutch lets me know, I could protect them because Dutch will listen to my opinions. And if someone had not made revolution with me, I would not dare defend him. Question. The last time you talk about seeing one of your students get into trouble and you could not help, how was that? And here is one man, man said. My student, whom I did not dare help, had been arrested by the base and sent. I met him. I did not dare because he had already been arrested. If I had known before and they had told me that this person was in trouble, I could have guaranteed that he was a student of mine. So that was actually a statement, a prior statement put to the witness. And the witness, I asked him, could you confirm that that was the truth? And he said, yes. Now, are you able to comment on that? Does it seem plausible to you that some high-ranking cadres had some margin of maneuver to protect, in, in some circumstances, to protect their own people? Oh, I'm sure it happened. Uh, the, the point, uh, it's all revealed in the statement. Once someone had been arrested, the whole machinery of the waterfall, if you like, was set in motion. There's no way to pull someone out of that uh, rapidly moving process. But I think that probably all through uh, DK, there were negotiations to stop that process from taking place. There was a great deal of networking, as we say in the, in nowadays, going on between people, protecting their friends and, uh, and uh, subordinates protecting their, uh, their patrons. Uh, there's quite a lot of evidence that despite the policy of flattening out uh, Cambodian society by the revolution, that a lot of these old hierarchies, or hierarchical behavior rather, remained fully enforced and that uh, patrons were expected to protect at least some of their clients, clients were expected to uh, protect or help some of their patrons. It's the way Cambodian society has worked as far as we can tell since the first uh, writing in the, recorded writing in the seventh century. Thank you very much. I have no further question, and let me tell you that some of us came here because we were happy your book, so I'm very grateful to have been able to put your questions. Thank you. Well, lady, I'm going to ask you to ask me to ask you to ask me 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 to ກະຫຼາຍສໍາລະສໍາລົມດອນແລະຊຸມນີນີ້ນອມລົງເປີ